Hello everyone, welcome to Dragonfly Engineering. So this week we've got a pretty short topic. It's gonna to be finishing mold surfaces with inexpensive, easy ways of doing it. Uh, primarily bead blasting and sand blasting. And if there's a little extra time, then we may repolish another surface on our mold that we made in a previous episode, the sample coupon mold. Uh, so if you wanna take a look at that episode to see how this mold was made, please take a look. But uh, one of my customers is curious about various finishes and options and two finishes on one surface. So we are going to explore the difference between glass bead blasting of the aluminum mold finish or surface and right next to it, uh, sand blasting. And we'll, we'll see what kind of difference we get in finish. All right, so the design of this particular mold, there's basically just a flat plane on the A side of the mold where the sprue, where the plastic enters into the part happens. So this is pretty simple. It's just basically just a big old flat sheet with, with an entry hole for plastic. And then the B side of the mold has these two cavities, which are different heights. And the purpose of this is to mold test coupons for various plastics to look at how the plastic sinks with thick sections as well as to measure the, the shrinkage of the plastic uh, from a molded part because just about all plastics shrink uh, when they solidify from molten state to solid state. So that was the original purpose of this mold. So now what we're going to do is, oh and then there's two ejector pins that eject the, the coupon off of the B side. So you can see how these Ejector pins push in and out, and the plastic squirts in, or no, the um, ejector for the sprue is in this area, which is not currently loaded into this mold. So, most of the work that we're gonna do is gonna be on this side, and you may be able to see an impression of the mold cavity. I cleaned this, this, this surface off, and so there's a few scratches, because the rag had some aluminum dust in it. So, but that doesn't really matter because we're gonna re, refinish this side. And to do that, we are going to use the sandblasting cabinet. Um, and effectively what we need to do is mask off this area of the part with what I use is just duct tape. And the idea with the duct tape is to have a bouncy surface so that when the sand or the glass beads, uh, typically you use half millimeter or 20 thousandths of an inch diameter glass beads, or just beach sand. Uh, when, when, the, when those high velocity particles shoot out of the um, sand blasting or bead blasting nozzle, if they hit the hard metal, they'll dent the metal and then bounce off. But uh, if they hit the duct tape, it's more of a rubber bouncy surface and you don't actually affect the metal surface underneath the duct tape. And the duct tape actually stays because it, um, uh, the energy is basically reflected off as, as bouncing uh, action of the particles. So, with looking at this surface, I am going to cut out and make our mask for uh, bead blasting one square on this guy. Uh, and because currently I have glass beads loaded in the uh, blasting cabinet. And then we're going to switch out and then uh, sandblast the other surface. In fact, the application that I have at the moment is to put a sandblast finish on top of a bead blasted finish. So I'm actually going to bead blast this entire impression of the, of the mold cavity. And then we're gonna go back and then mask half of it and just sandblast the second half. So it's pretty simple. You just, you know, rip off some duct tape or you can cut it if, if uh, because sometimes when you tear this tape off, it will kind of deform the edge, but it also sticks to, to your scissors. Okay, so I got a razor blade and I'm cutting out pieces of the duct tape here. This is just white duct tape, but it, any duct tape is good. You do want a kind of a higher quality duct tape so it doesn't disintegrate when you're bead blasting or sand blasting. And what I'm doing is I'm lining up the edge of this tape visually to the witness mark of the A side of the mold where uh, you can see the impression of the plastic part or more specifically, you can see kind of the, the pitting uh, defects created from the mold closing and pressing down. Uh, you can basically see a halo of the part. It may not show up on the camera, but I can see it here looking at it. 
So let me cut out another sheet of duct tape here. It's best to cut it with a razor blade so that you don't deform the edge of the duct tape. All right, I'll meet you over at the blasting cabinet. All right, here's the sand blasting cabinet. We've got our lid that props open. We've got two rubber gloves inside. And we hook up compressed air to the side, which connects to the nozzle. And there's a subtle air leak inside, of course. <laughs> so these are the glass beads. And they're just very small, round balls of glass. There is some, some soda in here as well, like baking soda, uh, which unfortunately I contaminated my glass beads with. So, but I'll fix that when we switch to sand. So let's uh, go ahead and blast a finish onto our mold. So we'll stick our mold into the cabinet nice targeted area right there and then with this nozzle with the ceramic or with this with this sandblasting gun with a ceramic nozzle I'm basically just going to spray glass beads onto our masked surface so I will glove up you got to reach through and grab this stuff with a glove and then of course we got to lower the top so you don't breathe all this stuff in You probably can't see much, but I am now going to pull the trigger and just do a light uh, coating of beads bouncing off of our masked uh, area on the mold. I'm going back and forth and up and down to try to get a, a uniform coating. And that should do it. And we'll open our cabinet up. And that is our surface. There's something funny going on right there. I'm not sure what that is. I may hit that again. Okay, whatever it was, it went away. So that is our bead blasted finish there with all of our baking soda dust blowing out. Let's uh, take it back over to the bench and we can take a look. All right, so this is what our masked area looks like after we hit it with the glass beads. And the idea with the glass beads is it creates a bunch of little hemispherical dents. And now the next step that we're gonna do is to hit half of this again with sand, which is a sharper, more kind of uh, shardy like material. And that should create a different surface finish on our mold. Let me see if I can get the sheen right. So yeah, this is a little tighter view of the bead blasted surface. And yeah, it looks kind of coarse on the mold, but after you mold a plastic part on this, especially an opaque plastic part, some of the coarseness is deadened down. Okay, hey, so I went to the local hardware store and got some play sand, uh, but on the bag it says, do not use this sand for sandblasting. And it also says in California, it will cause cancer. So keep all that in mind. Don't do what I do. Um, but sand dust can give you silicosis, I believe, of the lungs. So it's a good idea to wear a respirator as well. These sandblasting cabinets do have an air filter uh, so that you don't fill the place with, with uh, dangerous dust. But we're going to dump some of this in. All right, that should be enough. And then we put our kind of support grate back on. 
and you got to basically get it. They have a notch here in this particular design that your that your siphon hose fits through. And it can be a little tricky to get the get it under your gloves. Okay, so now what we're going to do is mask half of our bead blast surface and then sandblast over top of the bead blast to see what kind of effect we get. And this is all just experiments. I'm not going to get too concerned about specific dimensions or anything. Just approximately half is what we want. Okay. Now the sand I think is going to be more aggressive on the on the duct tape mask, the bouncy mask. So I need to be a little more cognizant of, you know, what's going on with this uh, duct tape. In fact, maybe I'll put a second coat on just for good, good measure. Because it is more sharp edges on the sand than on the glass beads. There we go. Okay. I'll meet you back over at the sand blasting cabinet now. All right. So now we just repeat the process with our new mast area and I put a mask on and safety glasses. Uh, you know, some just for good measure and you never really know how the sand is going to bounce around and out of the corners of your cabinet. So it's a good idea to wear the proper PPE. Okay. So this should be pretty light and quick. Uh, so I'm going to go ahead and shoot it. I still want to get good uniform coverage. So you want your nozzle to be, you know, like six inches away, depending on the nozzle and your sandblaster. You don't want to get too close because you'll start drawing out patterns and stuff. It's kind of like painting basically. And let's unwrap, see what we got. Oh, yeah, that's quite a difference. You can see, see a huge difference right there. So the top is bead blasted and the bottom is sand blasted. Surface finish. So yeah, that sand is definitely more jagged than the beads. So when you, when you bounce glass beads off of your aluminum mold surface, you create negative concave round dents in the surface of your mold. But then when you mold plastic onto your mold surface, those concave round hemisphere dents turn into convex hemisphere bumps in your plastic part. And it gives a real like uh, smooth finish or feel and a nice uniform matte finish to the plastic. It also resists abrasion because uh, there's you've got a bunch of round spheres of plastic and there's no high points that uh, can be deformed if you like rub your fingernail across it or something. But with the sandblasting, you're creating more uh, triangular dents into the surface of your mold, which turn into triangular peaks in your plastic part. And so the, you get a rougher kind of more matte finish as opposed to a satin finish that you get with bead blasting. Uh, and it is more susceptible to scratches and, and surface kind of blemishes because all of those little triangular points are, are very weak. They're stress risers at the top. So the plastic can, can squish down easier if you run your fingernail over a sand blasted molded finish as opposed to a bead blasted. But that is the difference between the two. I have a little bit of dust from the remnant um, baking soda that I had in the bead or the blasting cabinet. But yeah, that is visually two different surface finishes from two different bead blasting media. You can also do crushed walnuts and baking soda. The baking soda is more of a kind of a very fine matte finish that you can get, uh, but it's not really effective per se for, I guess, traditional plastic parts. Uh, okay. Well, I'm going to clean this up because there's still like kind of grit everywhere. 
and then we are going to reassemble this mold and stick it on the molding machine and see what our plastic parts look like. Okay, we're over here in the clean room and we're going to load up our coupon test mold with the two finishes on it. And today we're going to use the 25 metric ton boy injection molding machine. And the green robot today is just going to basically hold the extra GoPro. It's not going to do anything uh, since we're just molding just a dozen parts or so. So I probably will time lapse the loading of this mold. If you want to see other more detailed processes of loading molds into the machines, you can check out some of my earlier episodes. So let's get at it. So we loaded our mold and I am going to start heating up the mold and heating the plastic up. Currently there's ABS plastic in the molding machine, but we're going to be more interested in polypropylene. So we're basically going to purge out the ABS that's in there and replace with polypropylene. I had to play with the temperatures a little bit because ABS melts at a little higher temperature. So we're back and the mold is heated up and the plastic is heated up. So we are good to go. So right now I got my temperatures a little higher than normal. So the red and the blue circuits, and excuse all the wire mess, but I need to clean up my automation better, are set at 150 degrees Fahrenheit approximately. And then we are good to go. So you can see our, our little textured surface in there. So I'm gonna switch the molding machine to semi-automatic mode. And then when I hit the flashy green start button, we will mold our first part. And then we can watch the the display here as it injects plastic down to five millimeters, which is good. And it'll load its next shot of plastic, pull back the injection unit, and we should open our mold soon and eject our first part into our bucket. Okay, this mold is run before and this program has been already uh, proven out for this mold, so it's not surprising that it actually worked. Uh, well, it's always a little surprising that things work around here, but you get the idea. So we'll, we'll go to the automatic mode. I'll get our little bucket over a little better. See there? Well, I jinxed it because now we're, we didn't quite hit the cushion of 5.0 millimeters. So I'm going to stop this process and I'm going to do some small refinements. Previously, this mold ran on polypropylene, so the ABS does behave a little different. So we'll make our cushion size, and that's the transition from the molding machine just shoving plastic into the mold uh, to where it switches to packing the plastic in with high pressure. So we'll make it 5.5. And then we can also reduce our shot size a little bit. Uh, I'll make it uh, 17 instead of 18. So that should, that should do the trick. All right, so I'm gonna manually open the mold and eject our new plastic part, which ejected. And then we'll hit fully automatic and fire this off. All right, so it passed that step of having the right, the right cushion size. Because you need to have a little bit of plastic after you fill the mold just to transmit the pressure through the molten plastic into the mold cavity itself. It's kind of important to do that. 
So we are gonna run this ABS until the injection unit is cleared out of the ABS that's in there. Which will take, I don't know, maybe 15 minutes since these parts are so small. But I'll take a look at one of our parts. Yeah, there's kind of just a subtle difference in the surface finish. I've got gloves on, so it's hard to feel. But yeah, you could, I can see the difference in the light with this ABS. So yeah, that's interesting. I was hoping for more of a difference in the part. Let's see if I can zoom in. Yeah, with this, with this white color, it's kind of hard to, to make out differences. So we may have to, I may have to just go to the microscope and check this out. There we go. I don't know if you can see that or not, but that's what our first part looks like. And not a big difference actually, but ultimately we're going to be interested in blue polypropylene. So we'll just cycle out the, the ABS. These might be useful just as like, you know, wedges or something as well. <laughs> And you can see how the auger stopped moving on the depiction. So we will go to manual mode and then I will back out the injection unit. And then we will load our new plastic, the polypropylene. Okay, the first thing we wanna do when we switch from ABS to the polypropylene is I need to drop the temperatures of the injection unit by basically 100 degrees Fahrenheit across the board. Uh, Cause effectively what we were doing is purging ABS to run polypropylene. So I will switch this to 440 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see, you know, we got a bunch of red now because we're all of, all of the heating zones in the injection unit are about 100 degrees Fahrenheit too hot. So I have to let this cool down a little bit, but we can also run plastic to help cool off the injection unit as well, which is, you know, behind all of the safety guards and stuff. So, but in the meantime, I can load our hopper with our, with our new plastic. Let me show you the differences. All right, so this is the, who wants to look at my face instead. This is the ABS with white pellets in it. And then we are going to switch to polypropylene with the uh, blue color concentrate pellets in it. You can see that in there. And yeah, so you add basically about approximately 5% of color concentrate to your base resin. And the color can be affected by the color of your base resin where polypropylene is a clear translucent plastic. Uh, ABS is like a tan opaque plastic. So, and then I'll, I'll load this, this polypropylene with blue color into our hopper now. And it's dropped in and it's ready to go. Uh, this molding machine has a water chilled throat is what it's called. So where the plastic enters into the hot injection unit, it, it keeps it at 196 or well, I, the target is 194 degrees Fahrenheit. And that helps with um, preventing what's called bridging, where if your plastic gets too hot in the, in the pipe that leads it down to the injection unit, then it'll actually partially melt and plug or bridge over the channel that your dry pellet 
uh, drops into your heated barrel. So by cooling off the throat, then you can prevent that problem. Uh, and it also supposedly helps with like issues like black specks and other uh, quality of plastic issues. So that uh, you only really want to melt your plastic when you're going to use it. So you can see that the nozzle, which is the smallest and hottest part of the injection unit, has already reached the new temperature. But the center area where there's this big mass of basically a huge steel barrel with a bunch of heating elements and a big, uh, well, in this case, it's a small screw, but just a plug of plastic in there, it's all just heat capacity that takes a little bit longer to, to drain off. So I am going to see if I can run some polypropylene through after I back the injection unit up to help pull some of the heat out of the injection unit. So go to manual mode and we can go to the main screen and it's allowing me to auger so the, these temperatures are not too hot. The machine's internal safety limits allows me to run this plastic even though it's technically out of spec. This machine actually has an automated purge system so we can tell it to just purge and it'll back up the injection unit more and start pulling a whole plug of plastic in and it'll just squirt it out the end. And it will do that as many times as I, or as long as I tell it to do it, which is 30 seconds currently. And then you just wait here. Older machines, I'd have to manually hit the purge button or the, the uh, inject button and then the auger button and inject, but here it'll do it by itself. So now we got a bunch of hot polypropylene back inside here. And I picked up the safety gate. And you can start to see the transition from white ABS to, to opaque uh, polypropylene as well in our color. And I'm going to throw this outside because it's smoky and, and making kind of a fumes in here. <laughs> so this machine won't run unless all the, all the safety gates are closed. But we can do the same purge operation again. And we'll run this until I'm confident that we have very little ABS left and we're basically running blue polypropylene. The barrel or the injection unit volume is, is pretty small on this machine, so it doesn't take a lot to cycle out plastic. Larger machines like the 90 ton, this one uh, takes notably more plastic to purge out from one color or one resin to another. So this is what the, the new polypropylene looks like. And uh, yeah, I'd say we're getting there. I think I'll just start running parts because I can recycle molded parts, but it's harder to recycle these blobs of plastic because it jams up the grinder. So we will mold some more uh, with blue polypropylene now. There it is. Now we're, now we're making blue parts. <laughs> we'll go to fully automatic. But we, again, we don't really need too many of these, so I might as well just shut off the, uh, the gate to the hopper, which is right here. Because we only need a dozen to, to prove out the, uh, the profile or the surface treatment that we did to the mold. But we, we really do need to have plastic that's running in the, the specified window to truly get like an understanding of the surface finish we're gonna get. I've had some plastic parts that had thick walls that were textured. And when I'd start molding, I think this is ABS, the parts looked great, uh, but then the mold would heat up or everything would heat up, including the plastic that I was injecting into the mold. And what would happen is the part would eject and fall out of the mold and the surface finish would be great. But 30 seconds later, there'd be a kind of a shiny sheen over, over the surface finish of my part. And it took me a little bit, but I finally realized that the inside of the part was still very hot. And even though the surface skinned over and had the final kind of a matte finish, when it sat in the, in the bin underneath the molding machine, the heat inside of the ABS would, would transmit out to the surface and remelt the outside of the part, you know, because I was trying to get as fast as possible. So you know, that's, that's a good example of why you want to actually be 
in your process window to really judge surface finish. Uh, with that case, I had to basically slow the machine down uh, or the hold time, I had to slow it down inside of the mold by like another 20 seconds so that the part actually did solidify throughout before it fell out of the mold. And that's a good reason why not to have thick walled parts when you're injection molding plastic parts, but have thin wall parts so that you can speed up your parts per minute. We can check out some graphs again. <laughs> oh yeah, here's a, so I'm accumulating in this chart the stroke. Okay, so injection pressure as a function of the stroke position. So what's interesting here is, as you can see, the pressure, injection pressure versus position profile for the original, oh, my glove is falling apart. So the, the black line is the ABS pressure versus position profile. You see how it kind of shoots up at the end. But then the second distribution of, of curves is the polypropylene one. So it, it shows you how different plastics behave differently as you're injecting the plastic into the mold. So yeah, uh, ABS is a hump at the beginning and a hump at the end. Polypropylene is a lot smoother and flatter because it has a much higher uh, flowability when it's molten, so there's less back pressure that's required to pump or to press it into the mold itself. So that's kind of cool. <laughs> Just <laughs> spending a Sunday afternoon geeking out, I guess. And then uh, let's see here. So this is real time uh, screw stroke versus injection pressure. Oh, yeah, injection pressure is this side, the blue line. And then the red line is the uh, screw stroke. So you can basically see the pressure required to press the plastic into the mold. So the red line is position and the blue line is pressure, is basically what this is showing us. And you want those to look exactly the same when you're molding parts. You can see subtle differences in the pressure mostly. But watching this kind of stuff, you know, it gives you information on how rep rep uh, reproducible your parts are. Okay, we'll get a, a shot of the blue polypropylene part ejecting out of our mold. There it went right there. Starting to get bored. <laughs> Okay, let's, let's look in a little closer detail into the results of our surface finish experiments with the coupon mold. So this is the first plastic that we molded, and this is ABS, white ABS. And it's kind of hard to see the uh, difference in texture. Um, you can, the bottom surface is the, is the bead blast, and the top is the sand blast. I've lost some of the crud there. And yeah, it's difficult to discern a sharp difference in the two. Let me see if I can, if I can capture the light just right and reflect it into the camera. Yeah, I'm gonna play around with the camera a bit here to see if you can pick up. Yeah, there's some texture difference there, but it's, it's not very profound. So now, when we switch to the blue with polypropylene, you can see a much more profound difference in the texture. And then at the very bottom there, you can see some remnant of the polished or the, the semi-polished mold surface that we started with. So I think this illustrates that there's a lot more to part finish than just, you know, like the mold itself. You have to consider what plastic you're using and you also have to consider the color that you're using as well because this blue is more profoundly showing the difference in the texture of the mold surface than the white ABS. Uh, so, but I, I didn't really get a chance to do white polypropylene, but I think you get the idea. Anyway, so that is the result. And then the back of our part is the original mill finish with the two ejector pins and a shiny surface. So looking at the, the finish on the front some more, the 
bottom surface has the bead blast finish and then the top surface or this surface here has the the uh, sand blast finish so the bead blast finish the result is a bunch of little micro domes on the plastic surface because when the beads hit the mold it created negative dome shapes so when we mold we, we uh, plastic into the negative dome shapes we wind up with a bunch of tiny little positive dome shapes and that reflects the light differently you can see there's more of a sheen to the bottom sample square and then on the top this was sandblast with more jagged kind of crystalline square or triangular shapes of sand or silica and the result there is that it created a bunch of little positive triangular shapes and those triangular shapes don't reflect uh, retroactively or retrograde back to the observer's eye but it acts more of a, a like a beam dump so that's why the top looks a little more muted and darker and less shiny because it's basically sharp crags of uh, triangular shapes on the surface of the plastic resulting in this more of a muted darker color actually because there's less reflected um, light coming back to you so anyway that is the result of our first experiments with surface finish I think the customer is going to be happy with this this effect here so anyway that sums up our quick and dirty mold texturing experiment and hope you enjoyed the results again white ABS and darker blue polypropylene okay that wraps it up for this week so if you'd like to see more of these videos then please click the subscribe button and also click the like button for this video and you can also hit the bell icon if you want to get notified of future episodes of engineering automation and injection mold making and injection molding and whatever else we come up with. Thanks a lot. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye.